Welcome to section six, goal routine. Now, goal routines, if you don't know about them, is one of the major features in the Go programming language that anytime you talk to anybody about the language, this is what they bring up as one of the core features. And today, we're going to start on that journey that's going to allow us to write some really interesting Go application. So far, we've been learning some nice things about Go and some of the features with maps and slices and so on. And those things are nice. But Go routine, as you will see, and some of the other things that we're going to do, especially in the next section, is what really makes Go stand out as a new and different language. Okay, let's jump in. So, of course, we're going to do some basic things. We're going to look at what is a Go routine. We're going to look at how to create Go routines. Then we're going to get into a few more advanced things. We will see that once we can create Go routines, we will need to worry about when they finish and how to make sure that we wait long enough for them to complete their work. And that's going to lead us to talk about synchronization. And then we'll also talk about some pitfalls, some things you should look out for. Well, we're going to kick things off in this section, of course, with lecture one. And our objectives for this lecture are to cover how to create Go routines. And we'll do that using name functions and anonymous functions, which are the functions that you create without names. We'll also figure out what a Go routine is, and we'll do that indirectly by trying to understand the responsibility of a Go routine. Then we're going to talk about how your program ends. Now, this may seem like something we should have covered in section two, and we did. We said that your program ends when main ends. Well, now we're going to be creating Go routine. It's time that we make sure that we understand when your program ends and some of the consequences of your program ending when you have Go routines. So before we get into any sort of coding, let's just get some concepts and terminology out of the way. Let's talk about sequential functions. So what is a sequential function? Let's say I have two functions, one called producer and one called consumer. And what I want is the producer to create some data which my consumer will then use. So in that case, my producer must run first to create this data that I want my consumer to use, and then the consumer can run. But notice when I call my producer function, it runs the completion first. Because let's say I wanted to produce 10,000 random numbers. Even after producing half of them, it is possible that my consumer could probably start working on the half of those numbers, but there's no way to get my consumer to start working my producer must run to completion first before my consumer can work. So this is how we've been writing code so far, and these are sequential functions. Now, there's another way you can imagine things happening. You can imagine that if I could run things concurrently, which would require not only that my functions be written in such a way that they're independent. Now, that doesn't mean that a consumer doesn't need the data from the producer. What it means, though, is that if I could write things in such a way that once the producer produces some set of data, I can probably pass it over to my consumer, my consumer could start working on it given the opportunity, then I can say that how these function, if I can interleave their execution, I can say that how they run concurrently. Now, not only do I need to write my code in such a way to make sure that how anything the consumer does doesn't manipulate or trip up the producer in a negative way and vice versa. So you can imagine, let's say my producer is writing into an array. And then even if I could stop it and let my consumer consume some of that data, it's possible then that my consumer might try to access information or manipulate the area in a way that can hurt how the producer produce information or cause the producer to incorrectly start writing at the wrong location and all these other things. So if this doesn't make sense, you will see why in a minute. So what is P0? P0 is what I'll call my processor. So we had the same diagram before when we talked about sequential function. The only thing I added was P0 to mean a processor. For us, we're going to say a processor is simply hardware, a piece of hardware that can execute code. That's it. We're not going to draw any distinction between hyperthreading cores, multiple cores within one physical CPU or anything like that. Once we have hardware that can execute code, we'll call that a processor. So if I have a processor, and now I want to do the same thing, but again, we're going to make sure that our, our producer and consumer can run concurrently. So what does that mean? Well, it means then that if, for example, I started my consumer and there's no data for it to consume, well, that's not a problem. The requirement that a producer must run first was removed. And so now I can free to start my consumer. It sees there's no data and it simply blocks or waits or something like that but it's not a big problem. And I can then run my producer afterward, which produces the data that the consumer needs, and then things just sort of, the execution interleave at that point, 
and it doesn't really matter since they're independent, my consumer could return even before my producer finishes. And that's fine too, because remember, the requirement is that they're independent, they're free to do whatever they want. And so even if my producer produces data that a consumer doesn't consume, no big deal. So once we can write code properly that satisfy concurrency or this pattern of where these two functions can interleave their execution without tripping up the other one or causing an error in the other function because they're independent, then you can get parallelism for free. On this slide, I have pretty much the same thing I had before, except now I have two processors. We know that because I said a processor is just a piece of hardware that can execute code. I have P0 and P1 now, so I have two processors. I still have my functions. So how are things different now? Well, let's imagine that for some reason, I can launch these same two functions concurrently. Well, because they're already independent, they've been written to be concurrent, which means that oh, they can run independently. Well, now that I have multiple processors, I really don't have to wait in any one function for the other. Each function can do a bit of work, and then assuming that there's some way for them to communicate their work that the other need, then they can literally run in parallel. And so that's why once you can write concurrent functions, and you have the mechanism and the feature in the language and the operating system to allow you to run concurrent code, you get parallelism for free if you have multiple processors. If you have one processor, nothing changes. You still get to run your code very nicely with the ability that if you ever get more processors or move it to architecture with more processors, you get parallelism for free. We can compare concurrency versus parallelism. And concurrency is not parallelism. Notice when we had the code that was running concurrently, they weren't running in parallel. Piece of it run one after the other when we had one processor. But what happened, it was the way we wrote our code allow us to run in a concurrent way. If you don't write your code with concurrency in mind, then you cannot get the benefit of concurrency and therefore you cannot get parallelism, even if you have multiple processors. Parallelism is how the code execute. So concurrency is how we wrote the code. And once we have the mechanism in the language or whatever to be able to create concurrent functions, well, we can get parallelism if we have multiple processors and you get it for free. You don't have to do anything fancy. So before we go look at code, I encourage you to read this slide. I wouldn't read it for you, but basically it's Rob Pike, one of the designer of the Go programming language, talking about how concurrency is not parallelism. And at the end of this lecture, in your reference material, there is a link to a YouTube video which you give a talk about concurrency is not parallelism. So I encourage you to read this slide and to watch that video. Let's go look at some code of how you to create Go routines, and then we'll come back and review with some slides and diagrams what we see in code and see if that wouldn't help us remember and really have a picture in mind when we talk about concurrency and Go routines. So as before, I'm in main.go in lecture one for section six. And basically it's just a function I call producer. It takes an ID. And what my producer does is it prints out some messages. Right now, my main function doesn't call this producer. So we can go ahead and call our producer. Let's give it the number one. And let's compile, run our code and see what we get. And surprise, surprise, it's just five messages saying that it was produced by producer one. Well, we can call this producer multiple times, so let's do that. And we will run the code and we shouldn't be surprised at the results. So there we go. So this is sequential function call. We've called producer one to do some work, then we call producer two. What if we wanted producer one and producer two to be run concurrently? Well, right now these functions are independent. There's nothing that happening in the producer one function that matter when we make another call to that function. So we could have different functions, but in this case, um, each time you call producer, it's independent from any previous invocation. You could imagine writing a function where each time you call it, somehow it increments like a global variable, and then therefore each call to that function truly is not really independent from any previous call because each call sort of manipulate the state of some shared global variable. But here we don't have that. So they're truly independent. So how do we make these function calls concurrent? Well, we introduce something called the Go keyword, and we simply put the Go keyword before a function. And what this says to the Go runtime is create a Go routine for me to manage the execution of this function. 
Now I'll explain that in a bit. And when we get back to the slides, you'll see what I mean. I didn't have to change my producer in any way. I simply introduced the go keyword in front of the function call. I noticed it's still a function call. So let's go run our code and see what happens. And there you go. Look at what's happening. The results sort of differs here. I didn't see any result from producer one, but there are times when I run it and I saw some output from producer one. So here, for example, um, producer one produced some message, but notice what happened. It looks like producer one no longer always get to run first. And that makes sense because what we said is if we can run our functions concurrently, it allows for the interleaving of the function call. So here it looked like function two was running for a little bit. It got to produce one message. Then execution went into function one and function one got to produce all its messages. And then it went back to function two. Now you might be wondering, well then what happened here? Well, this is one of the pitfalls we'll talk about in a bit. And to really illustrate this, let's run both of these functions now as go routines under go routine, the management of go routines. So now we have created go routines to call these named functions. Notice these are named functions, right? And let's run it and see. Now we could run this as many times as we like. And chances are we're very unlikely to see any output. So what is happening? Well, this comes back to what I mentioned about when your program ends. What is happening is that we're asking the go run time to launch a go routine to run this producer function with this parameter one. We're saying launch another go routine to run this producer function with the parameters two. But before any one of these functions could get to run, our main function returns. It returns immediately after just saying, hey, create a go routine for this guy, create a go routine for that guy, and it returns immediately. And therefore, we never had the time for these functions to run because the main program exits. So that tells us when you create go routines, again, we don't know what go routines are yet. I just said go routines are created to manage the execution of a function. Okay, take my word for it for now, but we'll get to that in a bit. But once your main functions end, your program ends, and it doesn't matter how many Go routines you created, they will get killed. Let me prove to you that these functions run if we were to cause the main function to pause for a bit, uh, maybe one second, and that should give our two Go routines the opportunity to run these functions. So let's do that. So what I'm doing here is calling time that sleep to say sleep for a little bit. And you see what it says, the sleep function pauses the current go routine for at least the duration. And so here the duration is one times that second. So times that second is some unit that represent duration. And we are doing it for one second. So let's run it again and see. And now you see my program sort of waits there even after the, these functions finish their work. It sort of still hang around, but at least now when we run our code, we're going to always see our 10 messages. Um, of course, they appear differently. and We can't control that because it depends on when they get to run. Right. So the messages might interleave. We don't know. OK. All right. Now I can reduce this time because I think one second is probably too much. And this would probably still work. And it seems to have be enough time, one milliseconds, seems to be enough time for me to run for both go routines to get launched. All right. So that is one of the pitfalls with creating go routines. Make sure that you give them enough time to run. So if you create a go routine and then you don't see any work get, getting done from it, ask yourself, is your program ending before your go routine can get to do any work? All right. So I said that we can create go routine from name function. We can also create go routine from anonymous function. So let's create go routine from anonymous function. So my foo function here is very simple. It just writes some messages out again, just like my producer function. And we know that oh, I can create a go routine to manage this function execution by using the go keyword. So this we expect to work. 
Okay, so that's working. And again, the, when the messages show up, I don't care because it depends on when they get scheduled by the runtime and so on. I don't care. I just care that oh, they do the work I intend them for them to do. And that seems to be happening. So how can we make this an anonymous function? Remember, this name, foo, represents this function. So why don't we just take this function and put it in place of foo? Now, since I put that in place, I don't really need the name anymore, so I can remove, remove that. And of course, I don't need the function foo. And so if I save, notice how this is an anonymous function, which we, when we cover functions in section two, we said we can create anonymous functions, store them to a variable, or we can simply call them. And that's what we're doing. We create an anonymous function, and then we call it immediately. And that's what we see when we do a go, create go routines, we have to use the go keyword, a function call, not just a function name, but it's a function call. So be sure when you use anonymous functions, and you want to create go routines for them, make sure that you call that function. So if there was a parameter I needed to pass my function, of course I would be passing it here, the actual value, and this is where I would specify my parameter list. Okay, so let's run this and see what we get. And notice it works the exactly the same way, so you can create go routines from named function or anonymous function. We also see that you, you must give time for your go routines to complete their work because there's that issue of if you don't get your main function ends too fast, then your go routine won't have time to launch and do the work. Now, once we use the go keyword on our function, our functions, well, they're already defined, they're just regular functions. We haven't changed them in any way. So for example, in my anonymous function here, I can in turn call the producer function again, and let's call it producer three. And this is just another function that I can call. It's just that with the go keyword, I can launch a go routine to manage the execution of that function or the running of that function. So run our code. And you can see that sure enough, producer three, it, messages will always appear after foo because foo messages get printed out first, followed by the function call to producer three. But in terms of the messages from producer one and two, they can be interleaved between the foo and producer three messages. And that's exactly what you see here. Foo messages occurred. And then once that finished, and it started to produce producer tree message, that function, that go routine, somehow was interrupted. And then the go routine that's responsible for producer two got to run and so on. So you don't want to try and think too much about exactly. That's why I said that so it's important that these functions are independent. They don't have any sort of dependency between them that require that you know, producer one run for us or producer two run for us or anything of that sort, because once you make them go routines, we do not know when they will get to run. All we know is that they do some work and their work should be independent. In the next section, we will talk about how we can pass information between them so that they can do coordinate on doing some useful things. That's it. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Bye. So let's talk about your exercise for this lecture. Okay, first thing you're gonna do is copy the code you wrote for exercise one in this section. So section six, exercise one. So since it's gonna be the same code, the only difference then is I want you to use sing that wait group instead of time that sleep in the main function. Of course, you know that you have to update your prime sleeper function so that they can signal when they're done via the wait group. Welcome to lecture two in section six. And in this lecture, we'll talk about weighting and synchronization of coroutines. Our objective for this lecture are to understand some ways in which we can wait for a go routine to complete. And we've seen a not so ideal way of doing so already in the previous lecture when we used time that sleep. And we'll look at that a little bit closely. And then we'll see a more ideal way of figuring out how long we should wait. The problem is, if we don't wait long enough, if your program ends before the go routine ends, then the go routines are killed. 
On the other hand, if we wait too long, then we're just sitting wrong in our application when we have nothing to do and we're just simply waiting unnecessarily and wasting time. Then once we understand how to wait for Go routines to complete or to meet a certain point in our application, then we can talk about how we can use that mechanism to synchronize running Go routines. So, well, we have a couple of Go routines. The problem is we don't know how long any one of these Go routines will take to run. So let's imagine that time is going down the page. Go routine C finishes first, followed by Go routine A and then Go routine D. Then we can see that the other Go routine complete at whatever time is appropriate for them. The last Go routine to complete was Go routine E, and we don't really know how long this is going to take. So we can guess, which is what we've been doing so far, and that's the non-ideal way, and say, oh, my entire program or all my Go routines will take, you know, five seconds to run or whatever. And that might work, but then if for whatever reason we're running out of applications on the computer and they take longer than the timing we put in our application might not be good enough. And if we wait much longer than necessary, then that's also a waste of our time waiting for the application to complete. So we need some way so that when the very last Go routine completes, we know it and that's when we can end our program. Let's jump to the code. I want to start with a code that we wrote in section one. If we look at what we had before, as you can see, we created two Go routines, then we waited one milliseconds for them to complete their work. For now, let me simplify things. I don't need the third Go routine. I'll just work with the first two Go routines. I want to introduce a little randomness to how long it might take our Go routines, these functions, to do some work. So instead of having them print out five messages, I'll have them sleep for a random number of time. So let's take a look at the code we've written. I want a random number between 1 and 1,000. If I do rand that int, whatever number that is, and then I take the modulus of a thousand, what I actually get back is a number between zero and 999, but I want between one and 1,000. So I simply add one. So let's give us n between one and 1,000 inclusive. This is an integer at this point, and time that millisecond is a duration type. It's a name type. And so I couldn't multiply a duration type and an integer type, so I had to cast my int to a duration. Time to duration being calculated now as whatever random number we have between one and 1,000. Now, 1,000 millisecond is one second, and so this is d my duration. Now I can sleep for that time, and after I finish sleeping, I'll simply print out how long I've slept. If we run this code now, we should be able to see that our two producers are going to take different amount of time. Let's change this to say non-ideal sleeping. And you can see here, one of our producer ones said it took 400 something microseconds. I think that's incorrect. This should be in milliseconds, right? Because I'm using milliseconds here. So I don't know, let's see, what did I miss? Why is this printing out in microseconds? Let me do some debugging. Print out n, for example. Oh, this is microseconds, milliseconds. Ah, there it is right in front of me. <laughs> so that should be milliseconds. I don't want microseconds, milliseconds. All right. Not that it really matters, but let's do milliseconds. Okay. And so now I have this as milliseconds, but I'm not getting any output from my producers, even though my main that go is waiting for, oh, this is one millisecond. Ah, so here we have a problem. My program, my main is ending long before my go routine have time to run. So let's change this to one second. Try it again. And okay, we see that these producers are taking, you know, some random number. Well, it's the same random number. Well, we know how to create unique random number every time we run our program. We just have to create a new random source. So let's do that. We're using our own random object that's initialized with the current time. So let's see now. And that looks more interesting. So we can see that the 
Go routines are taking very different times, but we're still waiting one second. How do we know? Well, let's print it out. So what we can do is time how long it takes us to get from where we create the grow routine to where we complete the work. So why don't we say this is our start time and then at the end, we'll calculate the difference in time. And since we're waiting one second for our go routines to complete, then we have to calculate after the one second. So now we're simply subtracting time that now called the subtract function. So let's run it and see. And we should expect that number to be around one second because that's how long we're waiting. So yep, there we go. So the thing to notice here is that even though let's assume that since I have multiple processors, that these two go routines are running in parallel. So with that, the longest one took half a second, 500 milliseconds, but still I waited an entire second. So twice as long as my entire program took to run. Now, even if I only had one processor and they run one after the other, even with interleaving being concurrent, we can say that how they took the total time for both of these go routine would be about 850, even in 900 milliseconds. But still, I waited for an entire second. So you can see that even if you finish early, you still end up waiting a bit. Not to mention that if we were to do some work, for example, and we decided that, you know what, our go routine might actually take longer. I remember we only waited one second in main. So if our go routine happened to take longer than one second, then guess what? They wouldn't get to complete any work. So here we see that, that producer one took 997 milliseconds, which is almost one second, and producer one never got to run. Most likely it was taken longer than one millisecond. So this is not an ideal way to do things. So let's sort of reset things and let's see another way in which we can better time our go routine. And this is using something called a weight group. So you'll find in your reference material a link to the weight group documentation and this is part of the standard library so you don't have to install anything and you can certainly read about it here and i encourage you to do so let's jump in and use a weight group by the way a weight group is a structure the type defined as a structure and because of that and we know that pass, passing weight groups the function makes a copy of it for now until we get to chapter nine we we're going to use weight group as global variable basically variables at the package level instead of local variables that we could pass around to functions because they're going to run into some problems that we, we're not able to deal with yet. Let me go here and create a weight group. And that's all you need to have a weight group is just a variable of this type, which is a struct. And once you create a variable, it's already properly initialized so that you can start using it. So how do you use a weight group? The simplest way is to say that since I know I'm creating two go routines, what I can do is add two to my weight group. So what I'll do is I'll copy and paste this code and I'll call this the ideal way waiting for go routines to complete. And we will write a new producer function. So I'll do this, call this producer two, because producer two will use our weight group. And you will see how. Before we create our go routine, let's properly initialize our weight group to say that oh, we need to wait on two go routines. We do that by using the add function. Notice I intend to create two go routines, or I need to wait on two go routines. So I use add and I can pass an int. It could be one, 10, whatever you want. But it needs to be a number that reflect how many go routines you have, because each go routine needs to signal via the weight group when they've completed their work. So now that we said we intend to have two go routines, hence why I use two here, now I can put in my producer that after I finish doing my work, I need to say that oh, I've completed my work. So, and that's all I need to call the done function. And the weight group itself takes care of maintaining this data structure. And what I need to do now to know when all of these go routines have completed their work, instead, of using time that sleep, I simply say wait group that wait. Right? And so we don't have to worry about giving go routine time to work. We just simply wait for go routines to complete. Because start and elapse are already declared, we just uh, we don't need to recreate. Okay, 
So let's run our code now, and this is the ideal way of doing things, and let's see the difference. What we should expect is that we should be printing this message and our elapsed time should be no longer than the procedure, that the go routine that took the longest, especially if we have multiple processors. Again, if we have just a single processor, then it should be no longer than the combined time. So let's see. Okay, and so there we go again. So you can see with our old producer, we still finish, you know, under one second, but we end up waiting a second. But notice how things are happening for our new producer. Well, we should update our message so we know that oh, this is the new producer. And so new producer one took 129 milliseconds, two took 720 milliseconds, and notice how long it says we waited. We waited only 720 milliseconds, which is about the longest time for our two producers. And that is exactly what we want, which means our program ends after or we know that all our go routines has ended. And we can add more go routines and it will still work this way. So let's say we added, and then make sure that you probably initialize this at value because since you're going to be waiting on four go routines, you should make sure that oh, this value says that oh, you're waiting for four. So let's run it and see. And again, we waited for the slowest go routine to complete and no longer, all right? If we had to do the same thing for this, then we could run into some problem where we don't wait long enough. Now, because I have multiple processors, it's possible that all of these will get to run. So, yep, um, they got to run. But I've demonstrated already that if these were to run any longer by taking more time, then it simply doesn't work, okay, if we change this. And then you can go the other way too. You can say, what if these were to finish a lot sooner? Uh, let's change it across all of them. What if I somehow optimize my code and my go routines finish earlier, much earlier, what happens? And as you can see, in the first non-ideal way, we're still waiting one second, even though these finish in under 10 milliseconds. And then here, I waited not much longer than 10 milliseconds. For all intents and purposes, we can say this is 10 milliseconds. So definitely the better way of waiting. And that's why I say it's the ideal way, using wait group. Okay, so let's move things along. And we can go the other way also. And I've demonstrated that already. If we instead did this, and in the non ideal way, you'll see it how my producers wouldn't get to run properly because one of them started, it took 340. 54 milliseconds, so that finished before we timed it. But notice the other one took 1.4 seconds. This is after our program would have ended. But of course, since we were doing some other work, it still got to run. So that is not ideal. But then notice for our producer two, what happened? Well, the longest one took 1.7 seconds, and that's the one we waited for. So definitely the ideal way and the way should be so let's change this back to something like that. That's fine. Now that we know how to properly wait for go routine, we can wait for a set of go routine to complete. Then we can kick off a new set of go routine and then wait for those to complete and so on. And so that's how we synchronize the running of a group of go routine. Okay, in terms of reading assignment, if you haven't yet, do read the documentation for the go statement. And for the sync wait group, here's the link to the package documentation. That's it for this lecture. Take care. See you in the next lecture. Have a great day. Bye. Welcome to lecture three in section six. And today we'll be talking about pitfalls using Go routines. Now, I'm not promising to show you all pitfalls. I honestly do not know them, but I'll show you those that I've discovered and other people know about. So our objective is to be aware of when we're using Go routine is when your Go routines start, of course. And we talked about this before. You want to give enough time to your go routines to start before your program ends, else you won't see the expected result. You want to be aware of launching go routine in anonymous function, which when we use anonymous function, we, you might see them called closures. Or in Go, you might see them also called function literals, which means a literal function, like a string literal. Okay. And the problem here is when they reference the same variable or the closure closes over the variable as defined in the function. We'll look at some code and it should become clear. And there are some pitfalls associated with using sync that weight group. One of it has to do with how you initialize the sync weight group. 
but another has to do with not being able to copy a sync weight group. And there's a way to work around this, but we won't see it until we get to chapter nine when we talk about pointers. So we want to make sure that we understand how you properly initialize and use sync weight group. So let's jump to the code. I will start with an empty main.go file because I want to reuse the code that we wrote in lecture two. So let me copy that. So the first thing I want to do is look at what happens if you do not initialize the weight group properly, but you create a go routine. So let's say I decide to use weight groups, but I forgot to initialize it. What would happen? So what we should expect is when our program run is going to try and launch a go routine, we'll get to this line where we're supposed to wait for that go routine to complete. The way weight group work is basically this wait function is checking a variable in this struct to see when it's zero. And the initial value of that variable is zero. So since we never change that value from zero, well, when we get to this wait, it will see like, oh, this value is zero. It will assume that oh, there are no other go routines doing any other work. So the wait function for this wait group will return immediately. And we can run some code and we'll see that's exactly what's going to happen. And no matter how often we run this, most likely not going to see any output from our go routine because our function main ends too quickly. So even though we did the right thing by declaring a weight group, we just didn't initialize it properly. And or program run. So this is equivalent to not giving your go routine enough time, even though you're using weight group. So we can fix that, of course, by then adding a value to the weight group. Now here, our intention is to create two go routines. We pass two to the add function, but we mistakenly in logic or something, maybe you're creating go routine in a for loop or something. We mistakenly only launch one go routine. What will happen when we try to run this function? Well, think about it. I said earlier that the weight group waits until the value of that weight group is zero. But since we only have one go routine that will decrement that value, what will happen is we have go routine one, which will run this code. Then that will cause us to launch a second go routine two, which will run the producer code. We will be waiting for the weight group to be zero, but the weight group now is initialized at Two, after our producer function completes, it will decrement by saying colon done that weight group two by one. And so the go routine two that's running producer will terminate. And so now we only have one go routine running, the one go routine that was launched to run main. And that is now blocked waiting for this value, the weight group to be zero. But there are no other go routines that's going to be running any code anywhere else in our program. So we should expect that we should exit with a deadlock. And that's exactly what we get. We said all go routines are asleep. Well, the one and only go routine we have is asleep here waiting for someone else to call done on that weight group so it can keep decrementing it towards zero. An easy fix for this, of course, is for us to simply add another go routine. So we know how to fix this. Let's just make sure that we properly initialize our um, go routine. And so we can fix this by simply saying, if we're going to have two go, go routines, then we should launch two go routines. And that fixes that issue. Okay, that works fine. So we know how to fix that. Just be careful if you see deadlock in your program while we're using weight group, just try and see how many times you call add and with what value and how many go routines you launch. Okay, another thing you can run into is that here, for example, we intend to add two go routine. We created the two go routines, but we might unintentionally call the producer function. And we call this function that also decrement the weight group, but it's not in a go routine and it wasn't accounted for by calling add. So for example, what would happen is we will wait here until the go routine is zero, which means until both of these go routines finish, and then we try and call our producer function. Now we know if we just launch another go routine, our program is gonna end and it's not gonna have any time. 
But the same thing would still happen if we were to do some other work. Like I'll show you in a minute. We can use a time sleep to demonstrate that. But here, we're going to call this producer function, and it will try to decrement this weight group. But remember, the weight group at this point is zero. And you can see what happened. The result is we try to call done on that weight group. And since it was already zero, it caught that we were trying to decrement it further. And so our program exited because we we're trying to make the weight group negative. And you can demonstrate the same problem by simply commenting out this code. And if we now try to run this producer function, it will again try to decrement the weight group. So this has nothing to do with weighting. It's just the fact that our weight group is zero because we didn't initialize it to our value. And then now we try to decrement it and we should get the exact same problem. And we do. We can see the producer ran for some time, but then at the end of that, it tried to call done, which would make the weight group negative. We can easily take care of this by, of course, making sure that we initialize the weight group again. Let's just go with commenting out this. So we can fix the problem of our weight group initialization by simply encapsulating the incrementing of the weight group value in the function that we're calling. So let's assume that I were to rewrite our producer function so that instead of calling go on producer to create a go routine, I simply call producer and producer launches a go routine. When I want to call a producer, I simply call a producer function with a number it launches a go routine for me. Well, we still want to be able to wait on our go routine. So we want this before it exit to, remember this is a, just a function. So after it's finished doing its work, before it exit, it should call the weight group done on the weight group. But we're trying to solve the issue of a weight group not being properly initialized. So my recommendation is to put the initialization of the weight group in a function and have the function launch the go routine. So before we call go on this anonymous function, we can initialize our weight group. And since we only launch in one go routine in this function, every time the producer is called, then we should just increment by one before we launch that go routine. Because remember, you're going to run into a race condition. We increment this by one, we call our go routine, and our go routine now is re responsible for calling done. If we call these functions multiple times, we really don't have to worry about the proper initialization of our go routine. And now we're just simply free to call wait, knowing that regardless of if we call this in a loop or whatever, it doesn't matter, our wait group will be initialized correctly. So that would be my suggestion for how to deal with the pitfall of maybe setting some value, calling add with the intention of creating a certain number of go routine and probably messing it up with some logic to simply have a function that takes care of it. In this case, you hide the details of the fact that a producer actually launches a go routine. It doesn't really matter. For the main function to say, well, I want a producer, that's it. Producer launches go routine. So we've seen two things. We've seen improper initialization and we see incorrect initialization, and I would say improper usage. So improper usage is basically when you, you use two go routine, but you use a weight group in a function that is not a go routine. And so that resulted in um, this function is synchronous, so it really doesn't need to use a go routine. So that's the problem. But remember, your programming logic might result in this asymmetry between how many times you call had and with what value and how many functions you run that decrement that weight group. That's the real intent there and the thing that you really have to be aware of. Okay, so the final thing is about anonymous functions. And so we've created in an anonymous function here, or you, know, you could call it a function literal in Go. Some people might call it a closure. And so let's see what happened if we try to launch some Go routines which references a local variable. So for that, I will write another function, which I'll call launch workers. And the intent of that function is you will pass to it how many workers you want to create as go routines, and it will do it for you. So let's see. So that takes care of that problem. And of course, we're calling done 
at the end of our go routine before it finishes. So this should work correctly. So now I'll call my function and let's run a code and see what happens. Well, I launched my Go routines, but of course I didn't wait. So we know to fix that problem. So I need to wait. So let's do that. All right. So look at this. Is this is not what I intended? If you look at the function we wrote, every time we go around the loop, we want to pass the current value of i. So if we read this, i is supposed to be zero. The first time we come through, we add one to our wait group, then we create a go routine, and it's supposed to capture this value of i. So of course we get a warning here that though the loop variable is captured by the function literal. And so now this should be i. So when we launch our go routine, I expect the first go routine that I created is supposed to say I am worker zero, and we go wrong again, and the next one should be I am worker two but this is what this warning is about we capture the variable we didn't capture the value we captured a variable so by the time this go routine is ready to run it prints now the current value of that variable because it captured the variable and this is what exactly what we're seeing here by the time the go routine ready to run one of them happened to run and got the value when the variable was one the other one got it when it was three but three of them got it when the value was five and if we keep rerunning this We'll see that how sometimes, you see, they all get the same value and it's just all over the place. And we can never make any prediction about what value those goal routines are going to get other than most likely not what we intend. But one way of fixing this is to make sure that then we don't capture the variable. But there are conditions where you might want to write an anonymous function that do use the same variable that's declared in its enclosing function. That's where the capturing comes from, is that we're using a variable in this anonymous function that is defined or declared in its enclosing function, a parent function, which is this launch worker function. So you might think, well, if that is the problem, why don't I create a local variable in my go routine that then save the value of i? So you might think that this might work. And then if you use this, you think, well, okay, maybe this will work. But notice we get in the same warning too, because when that Go routine launches, we'll only then we will be able to create this variable. And it's only then that it's going to read this value i. And so we still have the exact same problem that we had before. Okay. So easy way to fix this is to simply create a new variable that is then captured by our anonymous function. So if I move this outside of the anonymous function, what happens is when we get to this line 41, a new variable is created. We know a new variable is created because look at this. We have a colon equal, which means creates a new variable. And that variable is going to have the value of i at this point, which let's say the first time we come in to this loop, it's going to be zero. This go routine captures id which is fine. That's fine. This variable is part of this function launch worker. It captures this variable, but that variable already has the value i at this point, which is zero. When we go around and increment i to now be one, guess what? We're creating another variable. And at that point, this new Go routine that we will try to create will capture that second variable, which is different because it has a different value of i equal one and so on and so on. And so now that's why we do not get a warning. So now our program gives us the expected result. Okay, so this is the pitfall that I want you to be aware of, is if you try to capture a value from the enclosing function, make sure that you are capturing a value that you intend and that can be shared by the Go routines. Otherwise, it's best to create new local variables and have the enclosing function capture those new variables we'll still run into a problem if we did this. This is still a problem because i is going to be assigned this value, then it's going to get captured. So it might look like it will work, but 
as you can see, we are already seeing problems. Even though we don't get a warning this time, we can see that this clearly does not work. And we know it shouldn't work because we have one variable, which is the exact same as this i variable, and it's capturing that variable. And at the time it captures it, this ID value could be something different. So we don't want to use this at all. Instead, let's use a new variable that's created and we capture that variable. And then we guarantee that it will work properly. So the last thing we wanna do is why you shouldn't copy a weight group. So to understand this, let's imagine that the way we want to use weight group is by passing it to the function. So instead of doing this, let's imagine we pass weight group as a function. So let's call this producer three. And so I pass my weight group as a function. I add one to it. And then of course I call it done. So this is one way in which we might imagine that we might want to use weight group. And so we see a warning already. So hopefully you can pay attention to these warnings, but just in case you miss it, this is the problem. Right now, our code works fine up to this point. Let me comment it out. So it runs a little bit faster. Okay. We want to deal with calling producer three with the weight group and of course waiting on it. So here's the problem. When you pass the weight group, since it's a struct, a copy of that structure is made. So at this point, our rate group value is zero, right? The initial value, because we haven't done anything. A copy of it is made. And within this function, we now increment one on that copy. On this copy, this variable is the one that's being captured by this anonymous function. So when we say done, well, it decrements correctly this weight group, but this was a copy from the one that we have in our main program. Here, since this was a copy that was passed to this function, this still has the value zero. So when we get here, of course, we do not wait at all. It just passes through. We can run our code and we'll see that's what happened. Now, what if we were doing some work in our function that resulted in our Go routine being able to run? Let's say, for example, we just had a lot to do after this point. So maybe we can simulate that with a time that sleep. Maybe we sleep a little bit longer. And as you can see, we slept long enough for our producer to run, but that weight group did not do anything, which we saw because we passed through that weight group. Fortunately, we are getting a warning telling us that this function call passes a copy of a lock. We haven't covered lock or anything, and we're not gonna cover it. Just know that you should not pass a weight group to a function in this manner. That's all for this lecture. Then there isn't an exercise for this lecture. If you haven't done any of the reading, definitely look at the reading material. It is the same for this lecture as for the previous lecture. Take care and see you in the next video. Have a great day. Bye. Welcome to lecture four, section six review. In this lecture, we will be covering the following. How many Go routines can you reasonably have in an application? This requires us to compare Go routines to OS threads. We introduce concurrency as a programming pattern when you have code that can be run independently. But we also need to be careful of concurrently running code that accesses the same data in ways that could lead to corruption or undesirable effects. Here I am in my Visual Studio Code editor, and I'll close the Explorer view to give us some more room to type. And if you look at the code I've written here, it's not a thing that you haven't seen before. Essentially, what I have is a constant that is set to 10,000, and it's basically the number of workers or go routines you want to create. I've tested this with a million, and it works. I've tried 10 million, and the only sort of problem I ran into was how long it was sort of taken to manage it. But other than that, you can really do quite a large number of Go routines, which I'll try to prove to you. The other thing I have are some variables set up. And you've seen this before. Basically, I just really initialize a random number generator and I have a weight group. So what is it that we want to do?
let me paste in some code and examine very simple setup of a go routine that we can launch and we'll run of course 10,000 of them and see what happens and so let's examine what this new code does I have a function and it takes a parameter int which is its ID and just like all of our producers before it the only difference now instead of printing out a set of lines what I'm doing is I'll print that this producer is finished and I'll do so before I sleep for a little bit and once uh, we slept for the, some random period of time we'll then print out a message then we will call the wait group that done to say we're finished of course the way we've written this if we've taken care of adding to the wait group before we launch our go routine so if you remember our number of worker was set to 10,000 so we should expect to create 10,000 go routines and we simply launch them as quickly as we can and then we will wait we in no way trying to control when they run and so we don't have to worry about that and that's all that was added is essentially this new function and then calling it and we can see our go routine ran and they said they were finished and we could see that some that were started very early took a while to finish but that doesn't matter we don't care about when they were scheduled or anything we just know that they ran and it should have been 10,000 of them and we did not have any issues with them running granted that didn't do a lot of work but that's okay we can change this to say well let's do between 0 and 5 milliseconds instead of doing nanoseconds so they take a little bit longer um, actually I don't want to, them to take longer because what I'll do instead is even create even more of them and I'll increase it by another factor and so now we have a hundred thousand go routines that we want to run and we could see we had like 98,000 here and um, probably 99,000 and so on above but again they run fairly quickly and depending on your computer you might be able to run a lot more than I have run you might be able to run fewer but generally you can run quite a large number of go routines significantly more than you can run the number of threads so what are OS threads? Well, OS threads are what is created by the operating system. So if you're a C or C++ programmer, you use the pthread library to create a thread. What that library does is ask the operating system, Linux in this case, to create a operating system thread to run a function. Those usually take longer to start up. They use more resources than a Go routine. What Go Runtime does is it manages multiple Go routines for any one OS thread. So if you can create one OS thread, then you can create multiple Go routines because Go will run many Go routines for that one OS thread. Therefore, since in any operating system, you can generally create thousands to tens of thousands of OS threads, it means that you can create you know at least a factor more than that of go routines the other thing we want to talk about is preventing concurrent access to pieces of code let's put on an example and then we'll talk about it because we can illustrate the problem first and then see how to fix it so let's look at the code that i've written it looks very much like the code we had before the only thing i've added is this variable called counter and now I have a function. Let's look at this function called update counter. Very simple function. And when you call it, it increments the weight group. Then it launches a go routine that simply increment this counter. So if you imagine what will happen is that we will have several go routines running and depending on when they're running, they will try to update this counter. If I am successful in launching 10,000 go routines, then since each will only update the counter once and then exit because it's not a loop they just simply update the counter say they're done and that's it then the result of my counter after i've waited for all of them to complete should be 10,000. so let's run the code and see as you can see we launched 10,000 go routines but our counter value is not 10,000. let's run this again still not correct let's run it a few more times so there's certainly a problem here now what is the problem well the problem 
is because when we have Go routines running and we have code running concurrently, our operating system or the Go runtime could interrupt this piece of code anywhere during its execution because it's supposed to be independent from any other code. So stopping it and going and doing something else and coming back to it later shouldn't be a problem because they're supposed to be independent. Now, this might look like one statement to you, but actually what this involves is actually three pieces of thing. First, we have to read the counter value. Then we have to add one to it. So we have to calculate the new value. And then the third thing we have to do is store the new value into the same variable. So with these three things to be done, if we can imagine that go routine X reads the current counter value, and let's say it reads one. Before it can increment the counter, it's interrupted and go routine Y gets to run. Go routine Y now reads the same counter value of one. It gets to increment its counter and it increments that value from one to two. And let's say it doesn't get to write it. Now go routine X gets to run again. Now remember, it's already read the counter value. It read one. So it increments that and now it calculates that, oh, the counter value is two. So now we have two go routines that have calculated the same value. At this point, go routine X has calculated two, go routine Y has calculated two. And so it doesn't really matter if go routine Y had gotten to write its value because if it had written two, X would have come around and written two also. And the problem is even worse because you can imagine that go routine X and Y both has the value two to be written into counter but then they are prevented from running because let's say their Y is interrupted and now go routine Z gets to run. And Z reads one, increments it to you know two, and then maybe it writes it back. Some other go routines get to read and increment and now we're up to 10. And then now we're back to go routine X or Y. And so they don't read the new value 10, but instead they write their much older value of two. And so everything gets reset. And so any other Go routine that runs after them now would be picking up the value two and incrementing. So it can be quite a mess. So hence why we see that oh, we don't get the expected value of 10,000. So this is a piece of code. This code represent piece of code that we need to protect from concurrent access. So the way we do this is very easy. We use something called sync.mutex, which is a mutex that's in the sync package. Now, what is a mutex? Well, I strongly suggest that you go read the documentation. This is the sync package documentation and use sync weight group before, which I suggested that you should read. And you should definitely read about sync.mutex. And it's a mutual exclusion lock. And for people who have done some Multi-threaded programming would know this as synchronizing or using a critical section in your code. And so we will simply say that using a mutex allows you to protect a piece of code. And it's very easy to use. As you can see here, the zero value for our music is in the unlock state. And you simply call lock to acquire a lock, which means you can make change to that piece of code. And then you can call unlock. Make sure you call unlock because if you don't, then you can end up with deadlock. But we're not going to spend time on that. We'll simply say that oh, if you acquire a lock, you should unlock it. So let's fix our code. So let's see the code changes I've made. So what I've done, I've added a variable called counter mutex. Since it's protecting this counter variable, I decided to call it counter mutex, but you can call it anything you like. And of course, the mutex is from the sync package. Once I've declared that variable, the documentation said, a zero value mutex is available for locking. So in the go routine that executes this piece of code will call mutex.lock. If it can lock or acquire a lock on this mutex, then it will proceed to updating this counter. But since only one go routine can ever acquire a lock at any given time, well, the other go routines, if they try to acquire lock too, they will be blocked. And that is exactly what we want. We want to make sure that anyone who reads this value and needs to perform these three steps on it, which is to read the value, increment it, and update it, they can do so 
without having to worry about another go routine coming in from under them and either changing the value or something. And then of course, once we're finished updating the value, we will unlock the mutex. And this will give the, the opportunity for another go routine to acquire it. So now let's run our code. Notice that I've only added three new lines to my program. One, to declare this mutex. Two, that has to do with locking it and unlocking it around the piece of code that I want to protect. Now, you will want to keep your lock and unlock to the smallest piece of code that you need because if there's lines of code here that doesn't need to be protected, well, that just means that the other Go routines can at least go run through those lines without having to deal with a larger block of code being locked. So let's don't think too much about that. Just keep that in mind. So let's run our code. And now you can see I'm getting the correct value, 10,000. Whereas before, no matter how many times I ran, I couldn't get the correct value. So this is the way to ensure that Go routine or concurrent code is prevented from accessing the same piece of critical code. So this works. Okay, there's one other thing I want to show you about things that run concurrently. Now, this is a simple variable. This is a counter. Now, you might imagine that if you were to use a map, for example, and you try to use different values for that map, then maybe you can access it concurrently, where maybe one Go routine might be accessing one key and another Go routine is accessing yet a different key, and that should be a valid way to use a map. So let's take a look at that. So let's talk about the code that I've written. So let's look at this update counter. I've changed the parameter so that the function now takes an ID. Of course, we'll pass that in. What the function does now, it still has the lock to prevent concurrent access to this sensitive piece of code, which happens to be these two lines of code here. One is to update the counter, and the other is to update a map. Notice that this map is doing essentially the same thing that I was doing with this counter, which is it reads the current value at this key, which the key here being this ID, and increments it by one, and then store it back into that same location. Now, since each of these functions will have different IDs because I'm launching them as Go routine. We should expect that even if they're running concurrently, they're not updating the same location in the map. So what we want to be able to see is that this should work correctly. As written, this code is being protected by our mutex from concurrent access. So we shouldn't expect any problem. Nothing new here other than passing in that ID the only other thing is because I want to be able to print our map and the current value of our map at the end of our program, I change this from 10,000 or 100,000 down to something more manageable that we can see on the screen to make it 40 go routines. So let's run the code. And we can see no problem, our counter is 40. And depending on if you feel like running through this, you can look and you should see that we have 40 elements in our map. We can actually print out the length of the map to see this. Well, let's don't worry, but yeah, we guess we can still print that out. Run it again. And so we have 40. So this is good. Everything is working great. Let's remove the protection that we have. And what we want to see, well, we know this is going to be incorrect. How we've seen that before. What we want to see is will concurrent access to a map work correctly. And notice our program dies. If you look at the error message, it tells you that the map is being read or written to in a concurrent fashion, and that is not supported. So if you're going to use a map in your Go application with concurrent functions that can potentially access that map, be on the lookout for an issue like this. So even though it looks like different keys to the same map will not collide, the underlying map implementation is such that it can detect when you're trying to modify it from multiple Go routines. So, so that's it in terms of code. Let's go over a few bullet points before we close out this section. So we've looked at how many Go routines you can run. And we see that you can run thousands of them, even hundreds of thousands of them. You can test it for yourself, but I've tested, like I said, a millions. So Go routine, as we said, are managed by the Go runtime and it creates multiple Go routines for any one OS thread, which means that you can have a lot more Go routines than you can have OS threads. 
you can run hundreds of thousands to millions of coroutines. This is in stark contrast to just a few thousand OS threads that you can create. We also said that the OS threads are sort of heavier because they use more resources, they take longer to start up, coroutines are lighter. So you, so you hear people call them green threads, for example, because they're so easy and lightweight to manage. The key takeaway from section six are GoRoutines are lightweight. When your program ends, all your GoRoutines are killed. So remember that. You can have a large number of them, so you need not really worry too much about, you know, you're going to run out of GoRoutines. Though you should probably not write an application that has many of GoRoutines in a typical day, but if you need to, you can do it. Keep in mind that a GoRoutine is managing function execution. So that's why you create a GoRoutine and you said, this is the function I want you to run and then that function calls other functions and so on right sort of illustrate that with some diagrams go routine makes it easier for you to think uh, about implementing current currency that is how currency is implemented in go it's actually called csp concurrent sequential processes but we don't need to worry about what the actual concurrency pattern is only that concurrency is a pattern and go language makes that fairly easy for you to implement. If all of your go routines are deadlocked, which means they cannot make any progress, remember that your program panics and it exits. In terms of reading material, you have documentation for the sync weight group. If you haven't read that yet, please do. Mutex, also in the same sync package. Very simple to use, not a lot to read. So read that, understand it, practice it. And then in regards to your lab exercise, you'll need to look at the strings package. There are a number of functions in there that's going to come in handy for your exercise. See the supplemental video that covers the lab exercise for section six. With that, take care. Good luck. See you in the next lecture. Let's talk about your lab for section six. Your task is to write a Go application that will count the number of occurrences of each word in an input file or multiple input files. You'll be writing two applications. The first application, will be done without Go concurrency, and that will be the iterative solution. The second application would be done using concurrency, and it's essentially a copy of the first application, but just updated to use concurrency. When it comes to reading files, I've given you a package that will assist you in opening a file and taking out one line at a time. The other thing we'll cover for your lab is how to measure time. The reason why we want to understand how to measure time it's because we want to measure the time it takes for your iterative solution to work on the same data input and then compare that with the time taken by your concurrent solution to see if you actually gained anything and how much was that improvement. Sometimes it makes sense to write things concurrently, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes the way you write it concurrently might actually hurt you and so you need to understand these things. Let's look at the problem we we're trying to solve, which we're gonna call the word count problem. Let's assume that our input data contains a sentence, to be or not to be, comma, that is the question, period. We can imagine if we were to feed this input to our word count application, and the task here is to count each account of every word, we should see an output that lists all the words that occur in the input and how many times those words occur. I will see that the word to will occur once and all the other word would say that they occur only once, but there is a problem. If you look at the word to, it actually occurred two times, but the first time it's with a capital letter and the second time is with a lowercase letter T, but yet they are counted as separate words. And we know that in fact, they're the same word, just happen to have different cases. Another example of something similar is the word B. In this case, BE occurs both times with lowercase letter, it's just that the second occurrence, it had a comma, which is a punctuation. So if the word has a punctuation associated with it, then you can end up with this problem. The reason we end up with this is because when we read our input, we decide to split the line of text at a space boundary, because that's generally how we delimit our words by putting spaces and punctuation. But if we split alone by spaces, well, this is what can happen. So we need to do some cleanup. And you can see that we will have a similar problem with the word question because it would end with a period. If we do some pre-processing on our input, before we actually either fed it to our program or fed it to the part of the program that's doing the content, we can identify certain things that we need to take care of. 
One, we should change all uppercase to lowercase because uppercase versus lowercase doesn't really matter for us in terms of differentiating the words. We just want to know how many times a word occur and an uppercase word versus a lowercase word doesn't matter. The other thing is we want to remove all punctuation. So this would be exclamation mark, period, commas, all those sort of things. Once we've done that, then it's okay for us to simply split on space boundary and now we can really just use the words as they are. If we were to do some pre-processing, feed this input to our program, then we get something that's more like what we expect. That the word to occur twice, B occurs two times, and so on. In terms of program flow, and for every application you can write a solution for in programming, we've said before that there are multiple ways you can get to the same solution, so different people do things differently. If you don't want to look at how I thought of this problem, then I suggest you stop here and go try to solve the problem by yourself. Otherwise, I'll show you one way in which you can think about the solution, and it's up to you if you want to follow it this way or not. So imagine that you had the data, which is again is the input we're going to set there in one or more files that is going to be fed to your application. And you had some piece of code that would be responsible for opening the file and reading a line of text until that input is exhausted. That input can then be fed to some other piece of code that would be responsible for cleaning it up if necessary. Maybe your input is already clean, so I'm not showing that there, but essentially splitting that line into words. And of course, I have to make sure a word boundary is correctly understood to mean spaces or whatever. And then that output, a set of words, which you have now passed another piece of code that can do the counting. It looks at each word and say, oh, have I seen this word before? How many times have I seen it? And of course, by now you can imagine that you'd be using something like a map for that. And then eventually, once you finish processing all your input and splitting all the lines and the words, then you write the output. And so this is the general flow of the program. And then we can imagine that an iterative solution of this would simply say, I start from the input once I get a line, feed it through my program, get to count the words, and then I go back to the input, get some more, and I keep doing that until I've accessed all my line, all the data, and then I could write my solution. So that would be your lab one. Lab two, like I said, is a copy of this solution, exact same problem, but now you might imagine or ask yourself, where can I do things concurrently? Now, if I have multiple cores, are there things that can run in parallel? Now, I'm not giving you a solution. I'm just saying that you could start asking yourself. Like maybe if we have to read several files, maybe we could read them in parallel. And once we have gophers reading files in parallel, they can then send these to other gophers that can split lines in parallel. And if we're splitting lines in parallel, then we can have gophers that are also counting lines or counting words rather in parallel. And once we've fed everything through all our gophers, then we can write the output. So that's one way in which you can think of it. It doesn't mean you have to make all of these parts concurrent, but these are possible places where you can have concurrency. And it's up to you to determine whether or not it will be a benefit in actually trying to read multiple files at once or trying to split files and lines in parallel or count words in parallel. And there is a trade-off to be made. And in the review for section six, we cover why you might want to prevent multiple access to code because if you're trying to count words and access the same data structure like a map with multiple gophers and you have multiple processors, then it can be accessed incorrectly. And even if you only have multiple processors, but if you're just trying to write concurrent code that access something like a shared data structure, we saw that out, it doesn't work correctly. So keep that in mind. So this is your lab and how you can possibly think of the two ways of writing it and solving the problem. Now let me show you some code that illustrates how to open a file, read a file, and how to do timing. Because we said those are the two things you have to address, is opening a file, reading it, to get the lines, and also timing. Because we want to be able to time our iterative solution and our concurrent solution so we can compare them. So let's go to our Visual Studio Code Editor. Okay, so here I am in my Visual Studio Code Editor, and I have just basically a outline of how you would generally want to process input from, let's say, a file or some data source or something. And generally, that would mean, let's restrict our example here to a file. The first thing you want to do is be able to open the file. Then once you have that open, you want to be able to read some data from the file. And since we're talking about text file, in our case, we will talk about reading one line at a time. And then once you get a line of input, you want to do some processing on that data or that line. And then eventually, when you finish looping over all the lines in the file, then you, at the end, of course, you want to close that file. So what does this look like for us using the package that I've provided you with the file reader type? 
So in terms of the code that I had previously, which is just a comment, now you could see I filled it in with some actual code to do things like opening the file. So we can see that if I'm using the input new file reader, I can just pass the file name that I'll be passing in from os.arg, you know, my command line. And I'm not doing any checking here to make sure that oh, I actually pass in an extra parameter, but those are things that you have to take care of because otherwise uh, your program will panic, which I'll show you in a bit. But it's very simple to use. I pass the file name and this returns to me a file reader and an error. If error is nil, that means I have successfully opened the file reader and I don't have to worry about closing the file. Notice I don't have to worry about closing the file because all of that is hidden and taken care of for me by this file reader object that I've wrapped up for you. Once I have the file reader, however, I can see scan. And if I can successfully scan, which means the scan function return or the scan method rather returns true, means that oh, I have a line of text that I can process, which I can ask for by saying file reader that text, and it gives me that line of text. Now I can process the line of text and then keep doing this in a loop. Once the scan method returns false, there's nothing else to get, and that means I'm finished. So let's run this code and see. So this is the code that we have to run, and let's run it. And of course, now that we want to specify a second parameter of the input that we want to read. Now, ideally, I would like to pass the main at go file itself, but it's text. So what I'll do is I'll build my program. And that gives me an executable. And so now I can see as input, well, let's try it without any input. So without any input, you see I have index out of range. Index out of range because I'm using os.arg to access the second parameter that's passed to my program. As we know, with os.arg, the first parameter is the program name, os.arg.0. So I need a second parameter and let's pass the same main that go. And notice that I've read the input and I've written it out to the screen. Now, in terms of the data that you will use for input, where will you get that? I have provided that for you also. If you go back up, into your, your project directory, you will see that there's a directory called test data. Within this directory, you will find a number of files. Sherlock Holmes.txt, which I grabbed from the internet, and these are symbolic links to this very same file. So the way you have multiple files of the same text, and so you can test with one file or multiple files to see how your program runs, because your program could operate differently if you give it one file versus Quite a number of files and so that's where concurrency also comes in the last thing we want to look at is how to do timing so if we look at this application again nothing that you haven't seen before we have a new random source a new random generator and in our main application we said that we were going to start some work and once we say we're going to start work well we want to start timing from that point on. so we grab the current time which is time that now very convenient from the time package and let's say we do some work. In this case, let's say we call the function. It doesn't really matter what we're doing, but we'll simulate doing some work. We'll sleep for some time. And then after that, we'll say that oh, we have completed our work. And so we get the time after we've completed work. So that will also be time that now. And so that's our end time. All we need to do then is calculate the elapsed time, which is our end time, which is later, subtract our start time. And these are all convenient methods that are provided by the time package for us to use. And so now we can print out our elapsed time. Let's run this code. And so see it says about two and a half seconds. And so this is one way in which you can do timing. Now, people who are uh, familiar with Linux or even if you're on a Mac, Note that you can also, let's build our program, we can use the time utility provided by our OS if you're in a Mac or a Unix system, Linux-like system. And now I can run my application. And so this is the time that I calculate in my application. And this is the time that is given by the time utility program. So I don't want you to use this time utility because if you're in Windows, you won't have it most likely. And also, I want one consistent way of measuring time. So let's do the timing within your application, sort of before you start even reading a file. So it's not just processing the lines, but actually before you start doing any work, which is reading the file. So I want you to time from when your application start, before you start reading the input file, to when it's finished processing all the input and just before it sort of print out the result. So what does that look like? Now that I show you how to do timing, let me show you my solution. Well, I'm not my solution, but what 
running it might look like. So I'll build my solution and let's run it. And again, I want to give it the test input data. So if you look at my output, you will see that oh, I still have certain things appearing as word, like numbers, for example, or even words with numbers. So I didn't do a complete cleanup, but I clean up obvious things like capital letter and punctuation. So that's what your result might look like. And this is for my iterative solution, my concurrent solution. Oh, and by the way, I can provide multiple inputs by doing something like this. I don't have to actually list all of the files, but that's another way that I can do it. I notice each time I run this program, you don't know the order in which the words will be printed out. Like I said, we don't care really about the order. It doesn't need to be in alphabetical order, just so long as you print out the right thing. And so this means use all the files from this test data directory. So here, for example, you can see that it's going through each one of those files and processing it and giving me the result. It took about 3.8 seconds. I won't run my concurrent solution because that defeats the purpose of you trying to figure out whether it's faster or not. So that's it for your lab exercise. If you have any questions, please pose them. Good luck.